I want to get this meeting started on the board. Start on time and end on time. My name is Ellen Steinberg. I am the director of CWC, and it is a pleasure to see you all and welcome you to this really special meeting. Historically, since 2015, CWC has really made a separation between the adult criminal justice system and the juvenile justice system. As we all know, our children grow up to be adults, and we need to start paying a lot more attention to what's going on, and that's what we're going to do today. Um, it is my pleasure. We have this incredible panel, and we have the best moderator we can have, Judge Forsyth, family court judge, and I promised her I would read her entire, um, well, I don't have it. Can you hear me all right? You guys want a mic? Yeah, I need a mic. Recording mic. No, I don't want a microphone. Um, okay, wait a minute. She's got this outstanding um, CV that I have to tell you about. Dean and I have two separate documents. Okay, I want to tell you a little bit about Judge Michelle Petraeus. Patron Forsyth. She is a first generation American. She's fluent in Spanish and Portuguese and also French. She graduated from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, with a BA in political science. Um, she minored minoring in international affairs. She attended university in Mexico. Now she worked in the White House. She worked in the United States Senate. She has worked for the Department of Defense, and she graduated from the University of South Carolina School of Law. Um, she had been associate attorney with Query Sauter and Listerman and Pierre Price. She has tried cases all over, and the best was when she was appointed to the family court bench. She has been an outstanding jurist in family court. And I want you all to join me in welcoming her this afternoon. <laughs> Do you all want me to use the microphone or no? <laughs> Whatever you all want. Um, most of the attorneys here know that I don't have any problems speaking loudly. <laughs> My name is Michelle Kemp Forsyth. Um, I'm so happy that you all are here today. Most everybody here I know, um, everybody on this panel I know, so I'm pretty excited. Um, and also we're talking about an issue that I'm very passionate about. And ironically, um, Mr. Boogdosser and I were just discussing, it's, you know, juvenile justice issues are rarely mentioned. Uh, but more and more, there's a discussion about juvenile justice issues, and we've been having this discussion for a long time. So I feel like I'm talking to people that already know uh, that it's important. But what I think you can take away from today is that there is a team, and this team continues to grow and expand. So this is a big deal. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about who's on our panel um, but I'm first going to explain a little bit about um, why we have a juvenile justice system. So in the late 1800s, uh, it became clear to people that um, youth were not getting the same treatment um, or appropriate treatment. Um, and in actually Chicago, the first family court was created to deal with juvenile justice issues. Courts are different all over the country. In South Carolina, the family court deals with juvenile justice issues as well as all other issues surrounding a child or a family, including adoption, child support, you name it. It's not like that in the rest of the country. Some judges simply do juvenile justice all day. The courtroom is devoted entirely to it. They control their budget, they control the floors, they control everything, including the dockets. 
Um, and the, by docket, I mean the number of cases or, or a calendar. That doesn't happen here. It's a little bit of a different system. But um, the family court in South Carolina was consolidated in 1977. Before that, juvenile justice issues were handled by county judges. And those county judges sometimes were considered magistrates. Um, they would handle those matters. Once we consolidated the system, the family court then had jurisdiction over juveniles. Now, how old of a juvenile? Well, up until um, a couple of years ago, I think it's a couple of years ago now, maybe three now, as time has, has moved on, it was 17 and younger. Well, maybe 16, just depended, right, Sean? Um, and now we are dealing with 17-year-olds um, who commit crimes. Uh, just a few years ago, you were charged with armed robbery and you were 17. Tammy, what would happen? You were charged as an adult. And so whatever trauma you had, you're sitting in high school, you get arrested, whatever trauma you had, whatever was going on at home, nobody cared. Nobody was interested. Nobody was looking. Uh, and that became an issue, and the state sort of met that challenge and changed the law. There was a little bit of a hiccup there. There was a delay because funding was going to be an issue, and funding definitely became an issue. And um, the Department of Juvenile Justice, where we have representative, <laughs> has met that challenge too and is trying to take on that burden. Because as you can imagine, suddenly the family court, uh, criminal defense attorneys, but more importantly, uh, public defenders were trying to navigate a whole different world of crime. We're no longer talking about kids stealing cars or shoplifting. We're, we're in a whole new world. Um, so at any rate, the system is designed to adjudicate delinquents. It's what we're, that's what we were trained with. That's probably not where we're going to end up talking about juveniles. But we were trained to deal with delinquency uh, and then provide services and, and get children through or navigate them through the system treating them like children, even though sometimes the crimes that they commit are very, very adult. So let's talk a little bit about who's up here on our um, lovely panel, and it's not going to be in order, so everybody raise their hands. I'm going to start with um, Asperita Pinkney, who is the Community Resource Coordinator for the Juvenile Detention Facility here in Charleston County and my um, new best friend. <laughs> uh, Radia Baxter, who's the Director of Programs and Education at the Sheriff's Office. Uh, Mr. Keith Smalls, who's my Community Keeper Mentor Group and is doing work within schools in Charleston County and in the community. I always get your last name wrong. Um, Todd Swans Swansinger who is with Father to Father, and you may think that Father to Father is just doing a uh, program, I'm sitting this way, <laughs> it's just doing the program for fathers, but no, they're actually doing other work, um, and he'll talk a little bit about what they're doing. We also have Stacy Bryant, our state coordinator with the Department of Juvenile Justice, who I was supposed to see last week, but I was in the middle of a trial. <laughs> and she is in charge of the new JDAI program, which is the Juvenile Detention to Alternatives Initiative. This has been a program that the uh, Department of Juvenile Justice has really been working hard to kind of get up and off the ground. And boy, as soon as Stacy came on board, it is flying. I mean, it's moving. So this is all good stuff. Um, we also have McKendrick Dunn, who is here with Low Country Youth, and Rajon Lewis. Tell me how I say it. Rajon. Rajon. Okay. I'm a big, I'm a big name pronouncer. Um, and so, and Rajon, you're the executive director, and then 
McKendrick, you're the program director, correct? Okay, great. So first I'm gonna um, ask some questions of um, Ms. Pinkney. And uh, Ms. Pinkney, I want you to tell us a little bit about, first of all, we have a new jail. And um, I don't know how many of you, how many of you knew we had a new jail? How many of you have ever seen the old jail? How many of, who knows when the old jail was built? Tammy. And he's a big word. <laughs> yeah. So there uh, came a time where um, that jail is, boy, something else, something special. Uh, there came a time where uh, children could no longer be housed at the jail. Tell us a little bit about how they came into this new building and, and a little bit about what you're doing. Um, the new building, hi again, that's Marita Paintley. Um, the new building, um, like you said, there was a lot going on in the old building. I remember going into the old building. It was just, it was really not good loving conditions for the children. Um, we do currently have like a new facility. Um, and if anybody would like to see the new facility, you can just reach out to me and I'll be glad to get with the people and we can do a lovely tour of the new facility. Um, I'm currently the community service coordinator. And as a community service coordinator, I go uh, a lot of times with the children when they attend court hearings. Um, I meet a lot and talk a lot with the solicitors in regards to some of the children that are at the facility, kind of giving them an update. I meet a lot also with parents. Um, engaging them on what's going on inside the facility. Um, so we talk a lot about what's going on. After the kids are released, I also do home visits just to kind of go out, just to see what's going on, see if the family needed any referrals or any type of resources that's needed. Um, so we're, we're doing a lot of things. It's a new uh, position that we created at the detention center. Um, and I'm glad that I'm in this position. Um, we also have a book club, uh, Judge Forsyth. And so the kids really enjoy the book club. Um, we're engaging now with Father the Father, so we've had Father the Father in uh, the facility. We've had 17 youth that have graduated from that program, and so that was awesome. Um, we have yoga. One of the solicitors, Amanda Monaco, is our yoga instructor, um, and so she comes in, and she helps. She does yoga with the kids. I've met with some of the kids who've done yoga. Um, we talk about it, and they're like, you know, they feel like they sleep better, and they feel more relaxed. So it's working and they're engaging in it, um, which is an awesome thing. So that's some of the things that we currently are doing at the facility. And um, you're not doing this alone because you've got your um, other partner in crime here, yes. Ms. Baxter. <laughs> and Ms. Baxter, um, and I'm just going to rod you up. Um, you're doing things with the adults, but also on the juvenile side. Talk a little bit about when you came in, you came in with um, Sheriff Graziano, um, and what was the idea? What was the intent? So the intent was to uh, make sure that we provide program opportunities and educational opportunities to uplift our juveniles so they won't come back, so they won't continue to commit crimes. So um, under her vision, uh, we started different programming and realigning, uh, especially with our relationship with the school district. Um, because that had a lot to do with it. And also, you know, with other interests, other entities like the library, um, with term nighting. Um, we also, and as Ms. Um, Pinkney stated, that um, the sheriff brought in two different new positions, her position and my position, to adhere to her vision of changing mindsets. Um, when they leave the juvenile facility, it either they go home or when they come to adult facility, we still have program opportunities. Um, we have strategic partners like Trident Tech, College of Charleston, um, Turn 90, as I said, we do some coping mechanisms. Um, we do career readiness um, program and some other, but our main thing is, is we're doing some cognitive behavior there because we know that if we focus on their brain and changing their mindset, then we know that they might come back and we're trying to get them to trust themselves so that they won't continue to be Now, um, anybody have any questions? Any questions? One of the interesting things is a transition when a juvenile who's been sitting in detention for a pretty serious charge um, has been sitting there in the juvenile facility and then has to transition over to the adult facility. 
when does that happen and what does that look like? If you both can talk about that, please. So um, when they turn 18, the moment that they turn 18, then they transition over to the uh, adult care. So 1201, they're sitting in the state during the process. Um, that usually goes for about a couple of hours. And then from then, they are uh, sent to a housing. And then, of course, there's some assessments that are done to determine what housing you can do you can be in and what area, you know, based on the classification. Um, what we try to do is we try to see, especially if they, they are already still in school, because you can be uh, 18 and still in school also. So we try to make sure that we see, you know, whether they are in high school and how, how far along they are. If not, we do have a rigorous uh, GED program. Um, I, I, I think we, uh, we, this was our first time ever a graduating high school student from the detention center under um, Chair Carlson. Um, so we're, we're, we're maintaining that. Uh, we have a, a GED graduate, and then once we do that, then we uh, transition them into our try to take over, which they will um, actually have our first four or will be graduating. I think they came to be in their schools. And so we're trying to get this to build upon. We still have a ways to go. We all have a partnership that we would like to think that that is. And this picnic, we have a uh, library now, a pretty extensive library, and there's some other programming at the juvenile detention facility for kids under 18. What does that look like now as opposed to when we first started? Um, when I first started, I think that it was just an idea of them not um, having no, or we're not having a person to kind of facilitate those programs. And so now we're at a point where we're able to kind of do that. We now have it where some of the kids who are 16 are interested in getting their drivers from there. So now we're in collaboration and we're going to start where they can now do their pre-test at the facility. They're going to do their eye exam. And if they pass their test along with their parents' permission, they'll be able to get the drivers from there. Which I think is a really great thing. Um, so it's, it's about ex exploring and, and putting them out there and just kind of teaching them things that you probably, for some of them, we want them to understand this is not the end of the goal. And so we want to get them through. And so I think just by empowering them, by the book club, getting their drivers from there, um, just doing other things in the facility. We have a uh, barbershop who's going to be coming in, who's going to um, take three kids and just kind of teach them because they're interested in barber. And so they're going to guide them and help them. Um, and so once in the, they're released, then they could be a part of the barbershop school once they do the facility, which we think is good. And so what me and Roddy do is when we get to that point of them turning 18, we kind of talk about, hey, this is this kid and all the things that this kid is done, doing, and then it gives her a better understanding. So when the transition does happen, they understand this is what's going on. So they kind of me and her and Johnson, and they understand this is what, what's about to happen. Now, we also have a new member of the team um, that deals with the mental health issues, correct? Um, so, of course, I think everybody in this group knows, but a lot of the kids that are coming in have mental health challenges. One of the most interesting things to me um, about these mental health challenges, having done a lot of trying to understand kids and trying to know how to communicate with them, can be a challenge. I have a young teenager, that doesn't mean I know everything, right? So um, they accuse me of mothering them sometimes. That's true. And that's also including scolding and lectures. Um, but a lot of the kids come in with trauma and uh, the trauma equivalent is the most fascinating trauma equivalent I've ever read. Law enforcement officers have a very very interesting type of PTSD that they're still studying. It's not the same kind of PTSD that soldiers have. Soldiers may have one or two traumatic incidents during combat that really change their mindset. Law enforcement officers have an ongoing pattern of trauma during the course of their careers that creates a different type of PTSD. Every officer in this room is probably like, I don't have that type of PTSD, Judge. I'm going to tell you, you do. You do. But what's interesting is, is a lot of the kids walking into that jail 
have the same kind of PTSD levels you all have. You're adults, so you're managing it on a very different scale. What I have learned, these juveniles don't know how to deal with some of the things that they're seeing. So when they come in, they're coming in in a crazy crisis mode. What happens when they get in the door? Uh, when they get in the door, they're assessed to intake. Uh, once they need to assess them, based on information that's gathered at that time, um, they, there are cases where we have to make mental health referrals. Um, so we make those mental health referrals within a time frame, mental health within 24 hours, they come over. Um, they assess them, they speak with them, um, and then they engage, and they talk about what needs to happen next. And if they feel like the kid maybe see a psychiatrist, we have a psychiatrist on staff, um, they can meet a psychiatrist um, or the nurse practitioner just to kind of talk about what's going on. And now you have a new member of your team. Tell us about your new team member. Oh, it's the Malcolm community. <laughs> 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 I, I can let Mr. Malcolm talk about what's going on. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm right next to it. Yeah. <laughs> We're right next to it. Um, the, the truth is, I, I work mainly with adults, but I am uh, housed in the, uh, my office is over in the So I'm often kind of talking to them about a lot of the issues that are going to help out their activities. And I foresee having spoken to the sheriff a little bit about this is that more and more um, there's going to be more of a mental health component on the interior side uh, to deal with some of the issues that um, it's bringing into uh, the detention facility. Um, so that's what's going on inside of the facility. I'm going to jump around a little bit here um, because I'm going to talk a little bit about what father to father is doing inside the facility and then start talking to our community leaders and then sort of end with what JBAI is doing and how it all kind of ties in. Is that okay? Perfect. Okay. So, um, Tom, you know, one of the most interesting things is this program, Building Better Bridges. And when I first um, came to the detention center, uh, just kind of being nosy, I think, uh, I, the first graduation really blew me away. So coming to the graduation and seeing kids learn skills, learning, um, I will tell you, and I'll tell um, everybody here, um, one of, there was one particular young man who stood out to me and who, um, he, he didn't make me angry at his detention hearing. What he did was remind me that he um, was likely to continue to offend and he was likely to get killed. Uh, my biggest pet peeve, as the public defender's office knows very well and has become more and more of a thing, is letting kids out when there is no plan. Uh, the most dangerous thing that can happen is a kid who's out, uh, whether they're on a monitor or out for probation, they commit an offense and then they are willing to do whatever it takes to get away from a police officer. That's my worst nightmare. And um, so when they're combative in certain ways, when they commit certain crimes, they're just not, they're just not coming out of detention. It's just too much of a, a risk to the community. Um, right after graduation, this one young man came up to me and he said, Judge, I want to talk to you. And I thought, oh, oh, oh. Um, and he said, thank you for locking me up. You saved my life and being here helped me change my mind. Um, he did such a change that he's going to the military. Uh, it was shocking. First of all, we thought, oh, I don't know that you can get into the military, young man. Your record is not the best. Um, but we started doing some work and everybody's kind of come together. Locking him up was not what saved his life. What saved his life was programming, including father to father. So can you tell us a little bit about building better bridges? Sure. So um, Mr. P and I, we 
came up with the idea of building uh, building better bridges is a program that we've been doing in conjunction with DJJ. So it's a program for youth ages 13 to 19 has a sexual based component on it, but also it also has a portion called reality check. And it's just really much that it's just a reality check. Why are you here? How are we going to change you from the path that you're on? So you don't end up in our fatherhood program one day down the line. So that's where the sexual based programming comes in. <clears throat> I will tell you with the program that we do in the detention center, um, I know you were at our first graduation. Our second graduation was phenomenal. There were so many people there, parents showing up and thanking thanking all of us. Um, you know, Major Harris, myself, all of our team for all that we're doing. But these kids have made even our, our we're on our third cohort in the in the detention center right now. Um, and just you can already tell we're on week five. We can tell the turnaround already by the kids that are coming in. They don't want to be there anymore. They 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 understand that they, the mistake that they made has not defined their life. And that's what we're really trying to make them understand. So we have them build budgets. This uh, this past week, they did a, well, we, they, did, they do an assessment to see what job skills might be the best for them. So we brought that into the detention center. But we also work with DJJ. We, we do it in both of our offices in, in uh, North Charleston and in Monk's Corner. So we work with kids that are with DJJ. They're either on probation, or you know some other kind of uphold their judge foresight will reprimand them and have them come to our program. But not a it's not, but it's it's an alternative to them, and it's easy if they if it's a nine week program. If they complete it, they're done. Like and that's what we try and tell them. So it's an alternate to, to them going to the detention center, but they're still getting so much out of it. The group that we have right now in North Charleston, there's there's nine of them right now with the North Charleston kids. We're on week five with them as well. And the turnaround from week one to week five is phenomenal. And, you know, there's there's kids there that now we, we're advocating for because they're doing things still in school, but we're advocating for them. We're, we're having conversations with them. We're getting them mentors from our fatherhood program to come down and talk to them now. So these are all great things that we're able to do inside and outside of the detention center. So, and it, it's combining all those things. It's, it's taking... So father to father isn't just working on fathers and absenteeism with children. We're trying to break the cycle starting at the kids. Because even last night with our fatherhood group, we, we started a component called healthy relationships. The first question we asked these dads is how many of you come from single parent households? 95% of the dads in our group, 33 participants last night in Tuesday night's group, 95% of them raised their hand. They came from a single parent home. How many of their dads came from a single parent home? All their hands still stood up. Same thing in the detention center. Same thing with the kids in PJJ. We need to break that cycle. That's the biggest thing. They need to have a two-parent household. They need to have a dad or a mom, what have you. They just need both parents support. So that's what we continue to work on on both sides. Thank you. Any questions? Surely someone has a question. Yes, ma'am. What is the sexual component that you mentioned? So we're, we're just teaching about STIs, um, all those things, um, how to put on a condom. We got goggles that sim simulate, uh, simulates like what it's like when they're drunk, um, you know, huh. so all these things. So we're, with, um, I mean, this, this campaign, if Major Harris was here, she would tell you, it, it gets, we get deep into it. <laughs> um, so, but, you know, but we really, we, there's no hold bar. So we really want to talk to them about what they're doing because most of most of these kids, let's be honest, all these kids that are in our program are sexually active. Some of them already are, are parents themselves. So we need to talk to them about you know South Carolina having the highest population of SDIs. We need to talk to them about the proper way to put on a condom. We need to talk. So it's just it's honest. It's out there and it's honest conversation of what goes on and what happens. Yes, ma'am. I don't have a question, but just a uh, just a comment. Um, my concern is that uh, young people or even adults um, beyond age 18 that have mental challenges are put in um, jail with everybody else and I don't know whether the legislators or who would fund a um, a building where you would be able, if, if someone you know commits an offense, yes, they come 
to a facility and you know there are consequences but we know that they're not um operating at the same level as some other people so there should be a team of people working with um you know these young people so that they don't you know uh, find themselves in situations that result a lot of times in them losing their lives and you know i know that the, like the officers that work with you know everybody that comes in they are not necessarily trained they may go to a workshop or a training just like in in school my major was special education but the regular classroom teachers did not always understand my students and so a lot of times because they didn't understand them they wrote them up you know for certain things that they should not have been written up it could have been a teachable moment but you know that's i i just wanted to say that i'm glad miss pinkney that y'all are handling situations uh, within four uh 24 hours 48 hours um, because when I was in the school system, a child might be arrested by um, an officer sent to Columbia for 45 days in a holding pattern, and they're not getting the services, you know, that they need. They come right back to us, and nothing has really changed. So I, I would really like to see, um, you know, something done for our mentally challenged young people young people and elderly you know people who have to be contained for whatever reason and i think we're going to talk about a little bit about that with um jpai i will tell you that there is discussions um within djj i think we've got the funding for a facility for children with uh, mental health diagnosed mental health issues and i do think that the court and I think I'd like to hear input from the public defenders, the defense attorneys, and the solicitor's office. But I do think that the court is looking at this issue a little bit more closely. If we see kids in crisis early on, we're going to try to get them services that they need. I, I think everybody agrees it's a slow response for sure. But I think at the detention facility, there are some things in place. And now, um, Director Hendrick is definitely taking the lead on this and, and pushing things in a different direction when kids are in that space. But yes, ma'am. Oh, I had a question. Um, it was about something from a bit earlier. Somebody had mentioned the cognitive behavioral therapy. And I was just wondering, like, with the mental health services in general, like, who is providing that? Like, is it, you know, is it someone that's employed like you know with you all is it like an outside kind of agency because in my experience i mean i don't deal with juveniles but like jails across the state you know especially the count like you know, well it's still count the jails but they just the mental health like is all over the place like some of them just don't have it you know or it's like spoggy like sometimes they'll have someone and then sometimes they won't for like long periods of time so I'm just wondering, like, who is actually, like, providing this and, like, where is the funding coming from? Because it's just a big problem, you know, across the state. Um, like I said, I don't work with juveniles, but at least for adults, like, I see that all the time. So I'm just kind of wondering. In the world of juveniles, you know, our our mission is to get treatment for they so the solicitor's office and the criminal defense bar is going to work together because it's a triage program, okay? They've gotten arrested um, clearly, and even at that first step, and if the law enforcement officers want to step up and, and make any commentary, even at the first step, there is an opportunity to send them with a parent. You know, they're not necessarily going to arrest and detain right away. So there's a lot of discretion there. And there's also some talk statewide about what that is going to start looking like in the future. But a lot of training for law enforcement officers, as I've been told, as I learned a couple months ago, um, is really focused on, is this a person we're going to detain or not? And, you know, they're running through calls. They're, they're busy. So they're not going to want to mess with a kid, usually. Um, 
But the minute they're in the system, this system is supposed to be designed to getting the, the services they need. What we haven't had a focus on, I think everybody can agree, and I really want to start talking to the community partners, um, is, is mental health. What is it that these kids have been exposed to? A lot of times, kids have been shot. The judges don't know. You know, we're not aware because that fact has not been pointed out to us, and we're not mind readers. So a kid's been shot, he's sitting in detention, he's got the medical treatment he needs. Maybe he's getting the mental health treatment now. Uh, I would say five years ago, no. So I just wanted to respond to her question a yeah. little bit. So we have strategic partnerships that we currently have. Um, I know Adita, um, Ms. Roberts back here with the Department of Mental Health. So we have been, we also have turning, turn, it used to be turn 90, um, our turning point, point. now it's turn 90. And then we're also um, garnering a relationship with MUSC to do the practitioner side of cognitive behavior. We're still working through those lines here. So we're building, just remember before, um, and we also have Mr. Malcolm here as I stated before, but before our, um, uh, before care for our young, I think it was just kind of basically the, the bare minimum. Mm -hmm. So we're working collectively as a group. And then I also wanted to respond to, um, I know under the sheriff's uh, initiative, uh, we've been trained, but some of our staff is being, mental health is being incorporated in our training. So that way that can add to that. Not saying that it's 100% or, but we're working towards those kind of issues. And statewide too, um, the Department of Juvenile Justice has implemented a new program that is using a outside source to do uh, multi-systemic therapy for kids and family-focused therapy as well. So there's a, a new push, and this is fairly new. I mean, this is new um, information. It's an ongoing change. It's an ongoing focus um, and trying to kind of look at that from a different perspective. Is it successful all the time? Does it, is it 100% though? But I mean, it's better than it was five years ago. Um, and speaking of what I think is better than it was five years ago is community partnerships. Um, so let me start with um, Mr. Smalls, who's with My Communities Keeper Mentor Group. If you can tell us what you do, and then I'll move down the line here. Well, uh, definitely state that not only My Communities Keeper sit here um, as uh, one of the steering committee members, which I'll turn to attention. Um, working that uh, some of our members are here with the Steering Committee. You've been here way longer than me. Tim, can you hear me in the back of them? <laughs> yeah. yeah it's all about, it's all about. Can, can everybody hear? If not, I'll give them the microphone. I think we should get from the microphone. Okay. Okay. Um, you just got to switch. There's a switch on there. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, can you hear me better? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so when I, I say it, not only as a founder and executive director of my community, Keeper Mentor Group, but I also on the steering committee, which house in ATV, which is the attention of attention. And I'm maybe, you know, there'd be some questions on some more conversation around that. Um, but I also work in MUSC in the Hospital Violence Intervention Program to combat gun violence, where I deal with individuals in the hospital space who have been victims of gun violence and been trained through the hobby and healthy alliance of violence intervention around trauma informed care. But at my community, Skip Event Group, we are our, our organization. I founded and I am the executive director. And we, you know, I think our two signature programs are the programs that, you know, everybody have been raving about and talking about is the boys will be boys in a girls' world, where we deal with a lot of high risk youth who have been referrals from not only DJJ, but yeah, youth advocacy program, and then also what we consider graduating from MUSC software violence intervention program. So you're dealing with kids who have uh, been victims of gun violence and they've been um, in DJD and been in the family court and been adjudicated. And some of them, most of them have been uh, unlawful carrying of firearm charges. I think over 85% of, of our enrolled participants have either been victims of gun violence or have that charge on unlawful carrying of firearm. And, you know, our boys will be boys program and the girls world program. You know, we specifically work around, you know, uh, family rules and relationship curriculum that says establishing and maintaining power, trust, and respect. I think Ms. Baxter talked about changing mindsets. Um, I often get the conversation as someone with lived experience and a returning citizen who served 19 years in prison. How did you do it? 
and, and a lot of the things that I did to, you know, elevate, evolve, and become a better person, I incorporate into our programming around establishing and maintaining power, power that exists inside you to be able to change the things that, you know, you, uh, what, what I like to say, in order to be places you've never been, you got to do things you've never done. In order to do the things you've never done, you got to think like you never thought. And that's what I always preach to them, thinking like you never thought. But we also talk about the trust issue. You know, every one of our kids have trust issues. And we also talk about respect factor. And what does that mean? And uh, we have, uh, you know, this social mapping, this what we call my communities keep a mental group steps to success, where you come to our boys and our girls program. And we have a vision board and we're incorporating in March this new element to our program surrounded by a bad piece. Um, some of you may uh, be more familiar with the Cure Violence model, which is something that's more, uh, I think, more known to the East Coast, but the West Coast is where we get advanced speech, where we're doing incentivizing um, uh, allowances to steps to success and community mobilization activities, social uh, intervention mappings, where we have critical thinking that's being taught by a professor from the College of Charleston who's on our board, Dr. Baker, who is a professor of psychology and ethics. And we also have uh, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy being taught by uh, one of our clinicians. I've been blessed on my journey, not only with the CJCC, but throughout the community that they really come in contact with amazing people who want to volunteer, who want to provide services like cognitive behavioral therapy, social emotional learning. We have a partnership with ACC, which is Stuart Williams, who has a youth entrepreneurship camp in the detention center. And we do youth entrepreneurship um, without you, without, without you. In the community, we also do financial literacy. So we do a, a whole lot of things, I, I believe, in the ecosystem, building an ecosystem around these kids, um, you know, and giving them those touch points, uh, the continuing of care. I think uh, we're learning more and more about credible messengers and mentors and how that uh, the importance of getting people who are credible to these individuals. Again, you know, myself, um, in a sense, I am like the consummate model during 19 years in prison, losing a son to gun violence. I was a juvenile, I was in foster care. So a lot of the similar things that these kids been through, I've been through, so they can relate. And um, most of my staff, I won't say all of them, a lot of my staff have are uh, individuals who have that lived experience returning citizens, but I also have uh, fellow teachers on my staff, as well as professors and other individuals who have volunteered from out the community. But my community is keeping mental group where new kids on the block, um, you know, but I, I, you know, I'm very high on, you know, uh, the potential for us to be able to move the needle in the community around these youths and their family. Uh, we also have family roles and relationships and other uh, apprenticeship programs that we call uh, economic opportunity, where we have barber and cosmetology. We have the HVAC school as well that does apprenticeship with us as well. And um, so you know, we're just delighted to be in the number and be available to these youth in these communities, but also to DJJ and um, the detention center as well. And the schools, we have programs in five different schools. So with the book club at Eaton Street Burns, uh, Greg Mathis Charter High School, where we're teaching character development, uh, resume writing, interviewing techniques, you know, where's the gamut? Um, I, I learned about nonprofit and community work in New York at a 15 year old in a community center. Um, this is not something that just happened when my son was murdered. Things that we've worked on in prison where we designed programs in the prison around mentorship and working with at risk youth. So, you know, just again, delighted for my community to give a mental group to be available for uh, these services that we provide. Um, Dr. Have you been able to work with DJJ directly? And what is a good way for them to be able to contact you or say a criminal defense attorney who thinks that maybe their client would be a good fit so that they can pitch the program to the court? As someone who was inside of one child distance, crazy child and joke, you would see um, phone numbers of attorneys um, sitting, you know, by phone booth. Uh, and I think my number is someplace on a desk. I often get referrals from probation officers, from the solicitor, um, you know, Dorchester, Charleston, and Berkeley County. I'm also a juvenile arbitrator with the solicitor's office. So a lot of my referrals come through that space. Um, you know, uh, we do have an open enrollment process, but, you know, when it comes to referring those juveniles from DJJ, whether Charleston, Dorchester, or Berkeley County, you know, we're just always me. I, it's hard for me to say no. So um, I don't turn them around, but most of those do come through a simple referral from either the solicitor's office or one of the probation officers or, or someone of that like. 
and um, Rayshawn and Kendra, tell us a little bit about your programming too. There's a lot, so I don't think I can approach a lot. Yep, so I'll start with, so I'm the McKendra Dunn, uh, Program Director for the Stewart Gentlemen's Club. So Low Country Youth Services has several different programs underneath. Um, Distinguished Gentlemen's Club is one of the oldest. Uh, we've been doing this work since about 2008. Uh, I've been part of the organization since 2010. Um, I'll let Rajan talk about kind of the umbrella of other programs, but for the for the uh, Distinguished Gentlemen's Club, we service kids 8 to 18, um, and we focus primarily on three pillars, and that's leadership, college and career readiness, and healthy relationships. So we build all of our lessons and activities around those three things. Um, we have about 19 mentors that support us. All of the young men in the program is separated by grade level. So we have age appropriate content, depending on what it is that the mentors are teaching each month uh, that we give to the young men in the organization. We typically follow the school calendar. So we'll kick off in August and start lessons in September. We meet every single month, at least twice a month. Uh, we are heavily involved in the community uh, throughout the Tri-County, so we do community service projects every month. We don't want a negative stigma with community service. We want the kids to serve the community in which they live and work, um, and we do that every month. We get phone calls from organizations and businesses all the time about bringing your young man out to support an event, uh, whether it's escorting kids at a Dream Girls conference or a community cleanup, which we own Railroad Avenue out of Canahan to make sure that that's clean, uh, or going to Dorchester Falls and working with the, the animal shelter, I mean, or Miracle League helping out uh, doing things there, Low Country Food Bank, literally we are all over the place. And a lot of times these community service projects, you'd be amazed. You would think that on a Saturday morning at nine o'clock that these kids have something else to do. In December, we took close to 70 people to Low Country Food Bank and packed out Christmas boxes for uh, the less fortunate. So kids are looking for something to do. They're, they're looking for things to be engaged in. And I think we've done a pretty good job of kind of creating um, the right energy within our organization that they want to be involved. Uh, they're connecting with kids all over the, the, the Tri-County. So a lot of times they're seeing kids that they would not ever see at any other time at our club meetings. So we have time set aside just for them to socialize with each other because we understand how big networking is, you know, whether you're in the you know fifth grade or the 12th grade, you're meeting people that you do not see at any other time uh, throughout the month. And this is something that happens every single month. Our parents are involved. They assist with uh, preparing meals for our kids. And while they're in session, we also bring in some speakers that will talk to the parents about, you know, financial literacy or, or any other topic, you know, that they have given us that they want to hear speakers come in to talk about. So we try to engage not only with the kids, but with the parents as well. Um, and we run until the end of the year. The big thing for us at the end of the year is our award ceremony. We recognize the kids for the, kids for the amount of community service hours that they give. Um, that they uh, contribute every year uh, for the amount of uh, lessons or um, um, monthly attendance that they come to uh, to the program. And we also give like um, character awards uh, at the uh, awards ceremony. We have hundreds of people that come every single year. Um, and, you know, we've serviced hundreds of kids over the year. And now we've recently introduced in-school programming. Now we're almost starting to double that number every year. Um, and I'll let Rajan talk a little bit more about the other programs. Rajan, yes. Okay. Um, do you think the work that you do to the courtroom space, or do you ever think, I really need to talk to somebody about this kid who I know is that in trouble and is doing all this stuff in the community? What does that look like, and have you ever done it? So that's a multi pronged question. Yes. All right. I'm, I'm going to get there. Um, so I, I'll start. I'll start there, and I work my way backwards. Is that okay? So um, there's been a lot of talk today about you know the kids that have already run afoul of the law, right? Because that's the, the premise from which we're meeting today. But the truth is that the vast majority of our children have not yet gotten in trouble. And I say yet because we all, everybody in this room, probably been in some sort of trouble in your life. When you made the mistake that you made in your life. 
how that was treated by the adults in your life largely dictated the way you responded to it, I imagine, in a lot of cases. If you were stigmatized and told that that made you a bad kid, if you were stigmatized and told that you're unfavorable, yeah, you're going to fall, fall sick farther down that hole. What our organization does is we create what we call the village. And what the village is, you know, the old proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. That village is there before you get in trouble. That village is there when you get in trouble. That village is there after you. So to your question, I have had to go speak at um, expulsion hearings. I have been consulted by parents about um, situations where kids weren't doing what they're supposed to do. But every time that thing happens, I never look at that child through the lens of the trouble they got in. Why? Because I had a relationship with them before. Um, and I see myself, I see my brother, um, I see my brothers and my sisters. Um, so with that being said, the village that we create is into our program. And Ken talked about um, one of our programs. We actually have five mentoring programs and a summer camp that we run every single year. Um, and we serve up between four and 600 young people annually. That's both in community and in school. So our community-based program, and Ken already mentioned a lot about, so I'm not going to go too far into that. But I do want to mention that he stopped talking about community service. A lot of times when kids think about community service, it's a punishment. Well, you got in trouble, so you, we're going to have you go out here and clean up uh, along the side of the street. Or you're going to go over here and you're going to sweep up Miss Mabel's yard because you got in trouble. No, my kids volunteer for it. They literally have an 18-hour community service requirement for our community-based program. That's both male and female programs. Between those two programs, we have about 110 kids. So on any given Saturday, you can see us at a low country food bank where he mentioned December, January, we were right back to the local country food bank. We right back over a thousand boxes. And those kids loved every second of it. They loved that as much as they would if we would have went to Frankie's Fun Park. Believe it or not. Nobody's in there complaining. Nobody's on their phone. Nobody's arguing back. And so because we built that, when a kid does run a file of the law and I need to talk to that kid, I don't get pushback. I've been with the organization since 2016. I've seen one fight. Sorry, I've never seen one. Heard one fight. Heard of one fight since 2016. That's seven years. Why? Because of the village. So in addition to our community-based programming, um, which I will come back to in a second, um, our in-school program. So we have our um, Young Men Rise and Girls on the Rise in-school mentoring program, which is currently in 13 schools between Berkeley, Dorchester, and Charleston County School District. We have formalized partnerships with the schools, formal MOUs, to come into the schools and give evidence-based curriculum to talk to these kids about things that they need to be talking about right now. Yes, ma'am. So evidence-based means that there is a accredited organization that creates a, um, a set of standardized curriculum, which is rigorous, like you think about like a, a school curriculum, that we go into the schools and we use as a guide for our discussion. Right, and we're talking about things like overcoming obstacles. We're talking about dealing with bullies. We're talking about finding a positive network within your school. We're talking about what's the difference between a mentor, a role model, and a hero. And are all of those things positive? Can you have a negative hero? Can you have a negative role model? Can you have a negative right mentor? That's the one I was listening to. Right? We're having these discussions, and so we go into the school for two weeks. They give us between 15 and 20 kids. We work with those kids for 10 weeks. And after the 10 weeks, the relationship doesn't end there. Because when they complete that and they graduate, they actually move into our community-based program that they can stay with until they graduate from high school. And then once they graduate from high school, the hope is they come back as mentors. So the next thing that we started developing um, was how do we make sure that for our young people who graduate and don't necessarily go straight to college, how do we build the infrastructure for them? For them? This next piece that we're doing now is building in internship opportunities. So the summer camp program. So we have a summer camp program as a three-week program, both girl, boys and girls. And for middle school age students, sixth to eighth grade. Because there's a lot of opportunities for elementary school students. There's not a lot for middle school students. For high for our high school kids, we actually hire them as paid interns to work with the kids over the course of the summer. They're learning job skills. They're learning how to how to supervise. They're learning how to project their voice and communicate effectively with people that, that they're working with. They learn how to work as a team. And for our kids that have graduated high school already, we're actually building in an internship program for those kids to come back and work with us throughout the year. 
That's how you build a village. Ken mentioned um, the parent. So many times we try to build programming without dealing with the real. Come on, y'all. Anybody been in education? Just me? All right, cool. One of the biggest issues we had is when you have a child that lacks accountability, you often have a parent that lacks accountability. And so what we do with our parents is not talk down and condescend to them and tell them why they should be better parents. No. We build a village where it's okay to come in and say, hey, I don't know this. Can you show me? Hey, I don't understand this. Can you show me? So each of the curriculum pieces that he talked about that we talked to our parents, those are all things that they told us in the beginning of the, at the, beginning of the club year. We want to learn about this. We want to learn about first home, first time home buyer program. We want to hear about financial literacy. We want to learn about if my child needs an IEP in school or a 504 plan, how do I get that installed? Can we bring those people in to speak to our parents so we don't have a parent that she's either? I'm not saying that to say that we're perfect. I'm saying that to say that if we're intentional, a lot of the kids that we're here talking about that are running afoul of the law, we can save before they do. Before they hit the prison, we can save them. Before they break into our cars, into our homes, before they get caught, we can save them. Before they, before they steal a car or murder someone, we can save them. But we've got to be intentional. There was a question last point. There was a question I was asked about the mental health piece, and I think that's so key. So a lot of times we start having mental health discussions about our kids after, again, after they've already gotten in trouble. We had a lot of people in this room today, and I'm sure each of you have your own individual influence. The question we have to ask ourselves is what type of resources are we putting into identifying these kids on the school level before they hit our prison, before they're in DJJ, before our officer has to pull them over and have that, un that uncomfortable interaction that may lead to a negative situation. How are we identifying these kids early? I think if we do that, we can solve a lot of the problems that we talked about. Today. I like that energy. <laughs> um, one interesting point that you made, and I, I hope that it's uh, clear. I, I think there's always a negative connotation with being in a courtroom and going through that process. And it is negative. It's uncomfortable. It's it's not something people want to experience. But sometimes that's the moment when the light bulb goes off. Sometimes, not always. Um, and the question is, is, what do you do then? And and how do you help help when the light bulb has gone off? And that's when I'm going to go to Ms. Bryant, Stacey Bryant, who's with DJJ. And she's going to talk a little bit about how all of this ties in together. No pressure. No pressure at all. <laughs> well, in the perfect world. <laughs> well, I, thank you for letting me be here, by the way. Thank you for letting me speak. So I, the program that I'm working, I'm going to do two things. Um, the program that I'm working with is kind of, hoping to before detention. So we're looking as hopefully most of you know here, I mean, Columbia, which is the main detention center for juveniles, our agency runs it, is overcrowded and will be overcrowded. Um, our, um, we, we have a great relationship with Charleston. They're amazing what they're doing. And we're very jealous of your facility. Very, very jealous. Um, and they're doing great things. But right now in our detention center, our detention center has beds for 60 kids. And I think I looked at the number, I mean, we're at about 120 kids. We're double capacity. So, um, and, and when we say that, there are kids that need to be in detention. We are not that, we're taking those kids off the, the, the table right now. Some kids who've done major crime and when we looked at this, I found this out uh, at our meeting. Um, right now at the detention center, 40 of those kids are there for murder. So they need to stay in detention until they go through their new pocket. Um, they need to be in detention. But we have kids in detention for truancy. We have kids for pickup orders. We have kids for stolen vehicles. We have kids for you know, um, you know, a hundred other reasons. And so that's what JDAI is. JDAI is going to be a program where the 
child is still going to be arrested. The child is still going to have a detention hearing in 48 hours, but they don't need to be sent to a detention center because what people, one thing we want everybody to understand too is because we have 100 and you know, 100, between 115, 120 kids there, we can't separate. We can only separate by age. So we do separate. We don't put the 12 year old with the 18 year olds or 17 year olds, but those 12 year olds, and we do have a 12 year old in our detention center for murder right now. He's in there with the truant and the, you know, pickup order and the incorrigible and the, you know, you know, the probation violation and everything else. And they're meeting kids they don't ever need to meet. Um, so um, what we, we are following a national model, JDAI, where we want to come up with alternatives in our communities. So when the police officers can't find a parent, you know, our parent is at work and can't leave work. Or the parent is just frustrated and said, I'm, I know I'm not. We're going to teach them a lesson. Parents don't want to teach them a lesson. Go lock them up for two days. I don't know if that's the lesson we need to be teaching the kids. Um, but where else can we put them besides in a locked facility? So that's the program that we're developing. And that most of the people here on this table are helping us develop that. Because we want JDI to be community driven. Um, that's the national model. We go on eight core strategies, and our number two priorities is community safety. And will the kids show up for court? And if they meet those two criteria, we should come up with alternatives for those kids. If they can't go home, another. And so most of the people at this table and other people, we're, we want to talk to everybody. Um, what do we, what, where do they go? And it, sometimes it will be, we're going to need beds, 24 hour beds. We're going to need um, one stops, you know, shops where, you know, it's, because we want, you know, we know the trials and tribulations that the police force have to, because they have to get back on the road. They're not here to babysit. They're not, you know, when they pick up a kid and the kids, you know, uh, being difficult, well, where's the best place to put them? And so that's what we're doing. I've given everybody a, you know, a folder and a handout. If you haven't got one, I'll get you one. Um, but it goes over the eight core strategies of JDAI. These are our models of what we're looking at when we're coming up with um, these alternatives um, for these kids of getting them services like the gentleman at the end. Um, you know, a good portion of these kids, they're detained, but they're diverted because they, you know, not all kids that are detained are actually going to be charged. That and, so, and their life is completely upheaved because because they've been now they can't go back to school because the school district has rules on detention kids that go into detention. So it really has a snowball effect on these kids. So we want them to stay keep their daily routine but keep the community safe and make sure the kid shows up before that forty eight hours to determine, do they qualify for a diversion program, which we want to do more of. Those diversion programs, which these gentlemen are doing and most of the people at this table are doing, those are amazing. They have huge success rates, and we want to make sure the, the right kids are going to those type of programs. Um, and then, um, or do they do need a community evaluation so we can decide what to, you know, for the judges to make a, a better decision of what's best for that um, child. Um, you know, that type of thing. Um, and then some of them are dismissed. I mean, the, the solicitor's office will say, we don't have enough to charge them. Um, so there's a lot of things going in. And that's why we really want, um, you know, we're real excited about this program because it will alleviate some of that. Not only the overcrowding, um, and that will have a ripple effect with, because we work very closely with the Charleston people in their detention center because their overflow comes to Columbia. They can't hold a status offense, which is um, a charge that an adult cannot be um, arrested for. It's the runaways, the um, incorrigible, the truancy. They, by statute, can't, they can't hold them. They all have to get in a car for two hours into Columbia, and the two, late, two, hour, two days later, they have to be brought back down to Charleston to have a hearing, and if it's, continue everything to go back 
And that's police officers on the road not being able to protect their communities. You know, so that's what we're really trying to make um, to do with this program. And we're really excited. Our community members are fantastic. Um, and we're this will eventually, in about three years, will be statewide. We are piloting here in Charleston and in Aiken right now. So. Um, how many of your programs are really approved for girls? We, I mean, we did it. We have, I mean, we have lots of girls. We have, you know, we do programming for girls. So, I mean, I, I always refer to them as kids. So, um, but, but you're right. We don't have, I mean, we don't have as many girls as we do have boys. So that's probably why. started talking about this more and more within um, JVAI is a lot of the female population um, is a dually involved youth, youth that are um, have a DSS case and also have their DJJ case. Their DJJ case is a, is a runaway charge. And the deeper we look in, into that, we, we always sort of go from the top down concern of sex trafficking um, and then kind of work our way down to understand Majority of the females who are duly involved youth um, have been sexually abused or assaulted. And so sometimes that programming is really hard. They, they become sometimes the most challenging case because they've just been charged with runaway. They shouldn't even be sitting in detention, but there's no place to put these youth. And so because um, Charleston County Sheriff's has a policy and actually it's federal law, that we don't uh, keep a runaway inside of a detention facility, they then have to go to Columbia. And the judges, if we let them out, they run again. So we are really struggling with that piece of the puzzle. What have you learned in the last couple of months about that? Well, what we're working on is that we are gonna have to develop very specialized because they will run, they do run. I mean, and that's that's the whole thing with a runaway. Um, but one thing we have to do, first of all, is make sure they're not a victim. And if they're a human trafficking victim, then they should not be charged with anything and we need to get them services and get them out of the scenario right away. But they will run quicker than a runaway because they want, they don't, if you've ever met a victim of human trafficking the first time, they don't see themselves as a victim. They don't see themselves as doing the being, you know, the, what they're doing is wrong. And they want to go back to that person who is hurting them. And so we, when we're looking at programming, we're even going to have to separate human trafficking from the regular runaway uh, because of the services needed um, for that. Um, and so we are, we know that we're going to have to have specialized programs and we're looking into those now with partnering. Um, but unfortunately, in South Carolina, there's not. I mean, right now, I mean, DJJ um, statewide, most of them have to go to North Carolina or Georgia because we don't have the capability to get them the services they need. There's some great ones, but they're still, um, their beds are just coming open. I mean, we've got some organizations that are doing amazing things with human trafficking, but they just, you know, bureaucracy, <laughs> they don't have the beds or they get filled really quickly in your life. I mean, you know, DSS and us, I mean, we're competing for the same bed. So we are always in that constant struggle of, of doing that. So, but we are, that's what we're talking with our community partners about how do we separate that and then who has the capability to help us. Because also the people that work for them need very specialized training for those type of things. I was going to add that in the mentors there, like what I was talking about earlier, so we started out as a program that was primarily with boys and middle school um, parents. But um, as we build capacity, one of the things we we're very intentional about was adding the female equivalent to the boys program because there is such a great need. Um, there are many, like what we found with, with um, for boys, they create mentoring programs, and for women, they have workshops. 
And so there's a lot of like women's empowerment, like conferences and workshops that happen. You don't find a lot of those for boys conversing, which is very interesting. But um, they, but so we have been intentional about making sure that we have created those um, female equivalents. It's still in the early stages. Our our, our girl program like we serve. Um, our, our boys program community base has 80 kids in it, 80 boys in it. Our girls program has about 15 to 20 girls in it, just because it's, it's brand new and people are getting used to that part of it. Our in-school program, we're in 13 schools with our boys. We only have, we just got our fourth and fifth school for the girls. So as that's expanding, I'm sure, you know, and I heard Keith mentioned as well, his, his programming with young ladies as well. So that's definitely coming. It's just that it wasn't, for some reason, it wasn't put in the forefront. But with the discussions that are being had centered around human trafficking and um, just the way society is right now, we really do need to grab our young ladies early and really have some, some really worthwhile discussions to help them um, to sort of uh, navigate with this world that's currently existing. Yeah, and, and if I can just say about our a girl group program, we have at least 25 young girls signed up to that. We have eight young girl mentors who are amazing. We have junior mentors who are amazing and most of them are credible messengers who have been trained either through YAP uh, in USC, but we also did a training with CPD um, around mentorship. And it is extensive mentorship where we do therapeutic circles. We talk about training their heart and creating safe spaces for these young girls. And similar to our boys program, establishing and maintaining power, trust, and respect for the girls, was establishing and maintaining love, trust, and respect, and talking about the true definition of love, what love looks like. And I'm a, I have one of my young ladies here as far as the mentor. They can explain better about that process, but you know, I, I same way thought when we do it with the boys, why not the girls? I mean, we do have girls in our program who have ankle monitors on, who have been victims of gun violence. Um, we have a young lady who was pregnant and she was shot in a drive-by shooting on King Street and she gave birth to her baby in MUSC and she's in our girls program. In fact, she's going to try to take an adult literacy program that we have a sense of collaboration with, with them. So. Um, it, it just equally as important with the boys as it is the girls that they get that continuing care that you get for mentorship. Uh, questions? Yes. Yes, sir. Mr. Ryan, you have a core strategy, one of the data driven decision making. Um, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, what, and I, that's one of our, yes. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, I was just thinking about that. Everything we, JDI is data driven, it's all the numbers. Um, so we recently um, pulled all the detention numbers from 2018 before COVID to last year for detention about kids. And it, it is very, and then also on what charges. And that is very telling because we talked about that. We talk about that all the time. I mean, you know, why did, you know, you know, in 2018, over, you know, close to 300 kids were in detention for pickup orders. That's it, pickup orders. Now, I'm sure some of those orders were important, but I mean, they're all important, but I mean, they were more serious, but we don't need to detain 300 kids for pickup orders. Sorry. Child is, say, under an order, whether it's a detention order, so they've been released and they have to follow certain uh, guidelines or they're out on a probation order, if they violate that, um, then DJJ can file an affidavit and provide an order and a judge can sign it. Then there's just the question of scheduling that hearing. Well, in the interim, they're just sitting there in detention. And, and that is an interesting statistic. And there's also, the, there's also a regional component to this. Some regions do it more than others. Uh, there's also a regional component to uh, truancy and children going into uh, Columbia, going to Columbia and sitting there for a truancy charge. Um, so I'll let you talk a little bit about those interesting numbers because that, that led to a lot of discussion from the judges. It did. And, it, 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 and, and so that's why data is so important because until we really, I mean, most people, we don't look at this every day. We don't. And so also our agency is taking this very, it's, you know, seriously that we are actually have detention expediters. We've hired two staff members that weekly, they look at detention numbers to see, to make sure we're not letting kids fall through the track, that their intention, that they are, and this is brand new. We've only started this this year where they are looking to say, okay, why 
because this kid who, I'm just going to give an example, um, who's waiting a disposition following an already, you know, a, you know, an evaluation, why are they sitting in detention? Why is it taking so long for them? Because we know from that evaluation that they're probably not going to be RC, that they're either going to go home on probation or they're going to, or we're going to get other services in place. But why have they been sitting here now two months? So we have to. So that's why data is so important. Because until you really delve really deep into the data, um, and we know from this current data we got that we have more questions. We're going deeper. <laughs> we know we're going real deep into it because people look at it and they go, oh, wait, wait, well, what about this? And so we're looking at it because it's going to help not only help the child, but it's going to help the judges and the public defenders and the solicitors make better decisions on what services we really need to get for these kids. That's right. You said that, sorry. You just said that the custody orders were issued on 300 juveniles. And Judge Forsyth, you said that's for one of two reasons. One, they're violating the terms of the probation order by the court. So GJJ themselves are issuing the custody order or they are, we're unable to get them into court for whatever reason, and a custody order has been really issued either because law enforcement needs to pick them up or they won't attend court. But there's a reason for those custody There orders. is, but there's processes that they, like internally, we're looking at internally. I mean, we know that as, as a state agency that maybe we're doing some stuff wrong and we need to correct it. We're not putting this oh, on the judges, right. but we all have to look at this. And it's also our internal way of looking at things that we need to do better as a state agency to help these kids. It's why kids are, it's when they're sitting for long periods of time that, you know, those internal mechanisms don't necessarily click. Like for example, I know when city of Charleston is calling at two o'clock in the morning and waking me up and usually they can't get a hold of me. So they have to call my husband because he's on 24 hour call all the time as a police officer. They come to my house and they're asking me to sign a pickup order. It's pretty important. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, they're going out of there. I'm sure the last thing they want to do is drive all the way to my house to do that. And of course, it's awkward. I'm in my pajamas. They don't want to come in, you know, but I mean, it's important. Uh, but the thing about that is I would expect, and here's another piece of this puzzle, the judge doesn't follow the child. I could sign that pickup order and never see that case again. So I don't have any continuity. I don't say, hey, I wonder what happened to John Doe when I signed his order and how long has he been sitting there? And also law enforcement doesn't know. And once they've done their job, they're like, okay, on to the next case. So there's there's a hole there, but it's not anybody's fault. It's just a systemic right. issue that no one's ever asked the question about. And then the only people that really raise the sting are the public defenders going, hello, are you going to let my client out? Yeah. Um, and that is a fair assessment. Yeah. I so, saw a hand, Captain. So I was just, um, I don't know if y'all have this date already. I really hope you do, but we started a juvenile risk assessment here in Charleston County. I think all the big four agencies started doing it. And I think most of us continue to do it. Well, we're all kind of looking at each other because it just became practice. And it's like, did you fill out form 12 of the 15 forms? Like, I guess we do, but I, I know we've probably been doing it close to 10 years and it was the assessment to get some numerical value. But one of the things that stood out for me when I was intimately involved with that, and it was done to hopefully get to the point that sounds like you're at now, so we got 10 years worth of data to look at it. But one of the big things was like you mentioned earlier is it wasn't that we couldn't find the parents, it's that we found them and they don't want to come pick up the kid. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. And and right. then what do we do then? So are they are they at wit's end? Do they have something else to do? Maybe or maybe not. We've heard the party. It's both. It's, it's, but, it's, it's, but it, it's it's that level of two o'clock in the morning, the parent is refusing. And now we're right and so i would if you don't have that data let us get it to you so you can see all the different situations um, um and thank you i i'm gonna get your information when we leave here we do have some of that data but the thing is but what what this whole program is is to help you guys so you don't have to figure out 
they go to a whole what we're kind of looking at so we're coming up with the two or three, you know the, those issues you know those scenarios but in the what we're really hoping is that then you bring them to uh it's kind of like a, a, a one-stop shop or something and then we figure out is it a dss issue do we have to get dss involved do we have to um, find somewhere there for a bed tonight for them to be until we can do everything so you can get back on the road and do what you have to do so you're not having to figure out and see our agency we do have you know we have a detention screening tool that every police officer should be doing we know you guys so it's you know we know it doesn't happen we know sometimes it happens um you know that type of thing to kind of figure out well yes this is definitely detained this isn't this needs to go but but when a kid is refused, because that that happens a lot, everybody, that happens a lot in the community. Like, I'm not doing it. I'm not coming to get them. I'm done. I, you know, I just, you know, I've got three other kids. I mean, or I can't get off work. I'm going to lose my job, you know. So, yes, I would love to see that data because it just helps us when we're coming. I mean, because data also helps with funding. As I said, we're not asking for any new state funding for any of our programs. When we alleviate the overcrowding, that money that we spend there is what's going to fund us. That's the good news. Can I just ask a big question? I was sort of kind of chuckling, but there are so many risk assessment tools, and the most hysterical part of it is the court doesn't know any of those numbers. So if you have a risk assessment tool, I will never know about it. Uh, when the jail needs their risk assessment tool, I will never know. DJJ has a risk assessment tool. Every once in a while, just for fun, I'll ask them, what does this number mean? They never discuss what those numbers are and how they came up with it. They don't discuss a risk assessment tool. So there's a million risk assessment tools out there and no, uh, no consensus. Yes, sir. Well, first off, I'd just like to applaud all of those people that are up there trying to do something about this. And I go to so many things where people talk about it and they don't ever do anything. You know, it sounds like you've got some energy to try to get something done. I think in, if you look at business, they track packages better than you track children. I mean, because they have a profit incentive. Yeah. And when that truck package goes on the truck, they know where it is. And you can look in real time. So if a judge really cares, the judge should be able to go to a dashboard right. and say, I signed that warrant. I want to know how long that child's been incarcerated. And if they shouldn't be incarcerated, they need to have a loud mouth like me go stand in the lobby and jack up some of the legislators and say, we need the funds to get this done because these are people, not packages. And they're much more important and we treat them cavalierly and we just got to be thankful to God that we've got Kendrick and Rajan and Tom and, and Keith and all of you up there and thank God that you're looking at the numbers. But if you're looking at the numbers and you don't have a dashboard for the people like judges and influential people who could get changes made, what's going to change? Nothing. Because we don't put this on the ballot in November, the, the public certainly doesn't know this is a problem. Nobody knows that there's a thousand foster children in Columbia. My friend's chairman of the Salvation Army. You got a thousand foster kids, nowhere to go. And you got parents, as the officer just said, hey, we ain't coming to get them. We don't, we're tired of them. You know, my job's finished. I did what I could. And it's just, it's really exasperating to think that there are this many kids floundering around. You know, I went and jumped in the deep end of the pool one time when my parents were doing the music program at a Lutheran camp, and I was drowning, and I just, you know, I went and jumped in, Mr. Big Shot, I'm going to swim, and I was bouncing off the top, going and waving my hands. It took about five minutes for the lifeguard to come drag me out, and these kids are waving their hands. They're trying and they don't have what they need, and so we need to know better where they are in the process, and if somebody's slipping through and i'm sorry i'm so no and you're, correct. you're so correct and the good news is if we do this correctly because we're we're the 40th state to bring jdai on and the states that are doing it correctly they've gotten their numbers down like um we were out in portland they had eight kids in detention eight hawaii closed all of their detention centers 
They do everything in the community. Except, I mean, you know, except the murder. I mean, well, Hawaii even lets the murderers. I mean, the kids. I mean, but there's maybe five. I mean, Hawaii doesn't really have that. You know, they have an issue, but not like, like they don't have 40, like we have 40 kids right now waiting. Um, I would say I'm from Hawaii. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're doing amazing work. They are doing amazing work. No. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they are. I mean, so so that's what's going to help because if we do it correctly, if we set it up correctly, I and mean, we're fast tracking this, but as I said, we're starting two and then three counties. So three, you know, because we want to be like those model states like Kentucky and some other ones that have only like 10 or 15 kids in detention because the community, because if they have services in place, because our kids need the services. And that's what all of these people here are doing. This is why it all ties in. I mean, there's even the Charleston Detective Center, the services that they're doing, we don't do those in Hawaii. They are, these are amazing things that these ladies are doing. Um, and so, and then our community leaders here. I mean, um, so that's what's going to save the kids. But just to further, further that point, I mean, what the captain said, a lot of it is parents. I mean, Judge Forsyth will, well, you know, she she will tell them, hey, you need to go to the father, the father, you need to go to the building better bridges program. I'll call the mom or the dad. They're like, oh, well, we'll call my child. I'm like, well, no, you need to bring your child here. We're even willing to provide transportation. We'll pick them up. We'll call mom. We'll call the child. We go knock on the door. No one's there. So then I so then I have to contact their their PO, let them know. And we're we're going back and forth with the POs, but but even the, the parents need to start to take responsibility because whether or not they've given up or what have you at that point, a lot of them that have been ordered to go to building brighter bridges, just like Rajan said, it, it's, it starts with parents. So when you call the house and the parents are like, I'm not really sure if you want to go, I'm like, uh, you don't have a choice. Like, she doesn't have a choice. She ordered it. Like they, you have to come, but they're just kind of like, well, so it is a fine line, and I know got to finish up, but um, a great ex I've got a great example of a young man who, from the time he was 13 on, I took jurisdiction, and it wasn't a happy ending for him. I mean, he ended up um, spending a lot of time in juvenile detention, and then ultimately, I think he's still incarcerated. Um, during the course of that time, his father was murdered. Um, although he had a DSS case and for a period of time, I actually gave, I gave dad custody. Um, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to him because they did establish a bond. But what happened was I had a mom who was just impossible to deal with. And there were several moments in time where I came close to putting her in jail for contempt. Um, and over a five year span, our relationship, my relationship with that mom completely changed because she saw me over and over and over again. And she also um, started to use me as a resource to say, well, there's another thing going on and you should know that this is happening. But in the beginning, she did not want to take responsibility. She did not want to take ownership. And that was really hard for a family court judge to hear. Now, we have limited jurisdiction in what we can do. You know, I would love to order her to do things, but at that point in time, I didn't have that ability. Um, parents need to get involved. And the more programming that focuses on parental involvement and getting parents to the table is great. I'm a big believer in it. If you look at the South Carolina statute, the first part of the Children's Code talks about promoting strong marriages and strong families. That's our object here. And yes, what family looks like is changing and it's different, but at the end of the day, like I've heard just about everybody here say, parents need mom, mom and dad need to be there as parents for their kids. No matter what has happened, they need to be there. That's what we're hoping to do. They so, need to forget that it's about, they need to forget it's about, it's not about their individual self, it's about the child that they're doing. Right. 
there's no question that we can keep going. Those of you who want to stay, I don't know who on the panel can continue, but if you give out your contact information, I think there's a number of people here who would like to, you know, follow up here. Thank you so much. She makes it look easy. I think family court, being a family court judge, must be the most difficult position to have as a judge. Um, I mean that. I've practiced in front of family court judges. I know these. Um, thank you all very much for being here this afternoon. Um, I just want to let you know that the CJCC, we're having a Zoom program on Tuesday, next Tuesday, the 28th from six to seven. It's entitled Know Your Rights if you're the victim of a crime. This is a program that we offer in English and Spanish on Zoom. So you can get the information. We have another CJCC meeting actually in this room on March 15th. It's going to be very different. We're going to be going into data. We do a lot of data. You know that. Yes, Stacy. Um, we will also talk about sharing data. It's very important. I, again, thank you all so very much for being here. One more thing. I want to point out Captain Jason Bruder, who is the chair of the CJCC, and also Keith Smalls, who is our co-vice chair. Couldn't do it without you. Thank you.